All right, hello everyone and welcome back. We have had quite a busy day with engaging abstracts, presentations, and live virtual demonstrations featuring the most advanced system and tools in 3D imaging, mapping, and treatment strategies. But without further ado, I'd like to kick off this session today and I'd like to introduce Vince Burgess, our CEO here at Acutus Medical. He will kick off this exciting introducing our expert today, Dr. Arjun Guraj. Vince, the stage is yours. Great, thanks. Thanks, Jen. Can you, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So, uh, look, the, the last three days have been great, and kudos to you and the entire Acutus extended team that contributed mightily here, and of course to all of our presenting physicians and participate, who participated in our own private, what I'm calling our own private virtual HRS conference. Uh, you know, I think that the depth and quality of the material here has been great. We've had presenters and participants from Europe, the UK, China, Japan, and, and all over the US. As our, our final presenter for our EP 3.0 conference, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Arjun Guraj, the director of the EP lab at Desert Springs Hospital in Las Vegas, Nevada, and chief of arrhythmia services at UNLV School of Medicine. Uh, but before I hand the floor off to Dr. Garage, I'd like to just make a, a few observations. Having been in the business of building early stage medical device companies for over 30 years, I know too well that the only way innovation happens is when industry joins forces with a true cross-section of physicians within a specialty. Some physicians focus on physics, some focus on science, some on clinical trial work, some focus on the procedural efficiency front. And to be successful, you need to work in all of these areas. In my experience, the physicians who challenge you the most are those docs who help you, in fact, force you to work tirelessly and relentlessly on improving procedural efficiency. And Dr. Guraj is just that physician. He has been with us for over a year in this regard on, and worked with us on the bench in animal labs and just recently in his own clinic after we installed our Gen 2 system in their lab in Las Vegas earlier this year. So Dr. Guraj, uh, thank you for all of your efforts thus far and for all of your help, all of your constructive criticism. I say that with a smile on my face, your encouragement, and uh, everything you've done and all the laughs over the last 18 months. And with that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to you, Arjun, thanks. Okay, thank you so much, Vince, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. It was, uh, it was too good. So uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, I'm a big user of this technology, which I find really fascinating. It's gonna open up a lot of doors for a lot of what we're doing with atrial arrhythmias in the future, in my opinion. So we're already seeing that in my lab at Desert Springs Hospital in Las Vegas. So what I'd like to talk about is I'm not going to spend too much time on the physics and the biophysics of the system because I think you've had that uh, discussed uh, during this symposium, but I'm going to really speak about a workflow that I believe is really important. Whether or not you use Acutus, I think it's tremendously important that we all aim for a zero fluoro workflow. Uh, I will talk more about this, but I'm not a low fluoro guy. I'm a zero fluoro guy. I don't wear lead. My staff doesn't wear lead. And uh, I'd like to talk about how I do that, number one. And then, definitely, I th uh, we've done every case with Acutus fluorolessly. In fact, I've never, ever seen this basket on x-ray, except in the picture. Never in my lab. So um, I'm going to show you how we do this. And I think it can be done in any EP lab. So let's get started. So the real issue is why you reduce fluoroscopy. It's a very, very good question. And if anyone has been reading Heart Rhythm, just uh, Dr. David Haynes just wrote a op-ed piece talking about a shift of paradigm in the labs. Uh, I don't think this is anything new, but he, he, made a, he made a statement that I think we should move toward not zero, low fluoro, but zero fluoro type situation. So we're gonna talk about that. So what are the dangers of radiation? Well, we all know about the stochastic and the deterministic sequelae of radiation. Stochastic, obviously, the dose is not known, but 
there is enough said, unfortunately, from nuclear accidents, et cetera, et cetera, that radiation does cause cancer. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about, some people have asked me questions about how, how much at risk are you from cancer from having UP studies, et cetera. We might touch on that at the end, maybe as a Q and A issue. The Deter deterministic issues are like tissue reactions. I have a table on the right side. If you can see, hopefully, you can see the arrow on my screen. Um, you know, once upon a time back in the late '90s, when I started doing all this, we used to do uh, CRT ICDs back then using, you know, uh, sometimes 80 to 90 minutes of fluoro time. Uh, those are crazy times, and unfortunately, some of these patients would end up with some of these uh, skin reactions that unfortunately can be irreversible in many cases. So this is also another reason, not only for our safety, but the patient's safety. There are some very minimal data. Those data do point possibly toward increased rate of fatal lymph disease with EP procedures. Very small trials, obviously uh, a tough thing to follow since the event rate's so low, but some have uh, talked about this and I don't think we should take it lightly by any means. As far as our patients are concerned, uh, clearly if you're using fluoroscopy, you'll be using a lot more with obese patients. Women are more um, sensitive to it as well, as well as children. In fact, most of the pediatric electrophysiologists, I'm sure you know, don't use fluoroscopy. I don't know many that use fluoroscopy at all when they do uh, children's EP studies. Uh, the health of the EP personnel is very, very important as well. It's not just, uh, it's not just us, it's everyone in the lab, our anesthesiologists, our technicians, our nurses. It's, it's the whole lab. They're all getting irradiated during a fluoroscopy. Um, so if we can limit that, I think it's best for uh, everyone involved. People have talked about serotaxis, robotic uh, um, ways of doing this, but unfortunately, if you've used serotaxis, of course, you need to use a little bit of fluoroscopy for positioning, but also the patient is not uh, immune sometimes to the uh, radiation in that type of procedure. And finally, uh, I don't think we have to say that I think uh, most of us who have been doing this for 20 plus years now um, are not too happy with wearing lead and standing up the whole time. Uh, we know that clearly orthopedic occupational injuries associated with this, so that could also be reduced by going to not a low floor system, but zero floors. You don't walk into the lab at all for fluoroscopy. So radiation exposure has many variables. Uh, I just put this in here. It's expressed in Siever. I'm not going to go over radiology today because I find it tremendously uh, monotonous, but uh, I do want to kind of tell you that uh, 50 chest x-rays is equal to one millisievert. And I just put that up because I'm going to have a table showing kind of a, a comparison of what we do in cardiology to put this in perspective. The equipment makes a difference. Unfortunately, there's a lot of old labs out there using old fluoroscopy units uh, that have very high radiation risk. Uh, so this has to be taken into account. I did talk about patient characteristics. It's also changed exposure. You might have to go to high rate uh, fluoro or frame rate fluoro for obese patients. Case volume is obviously very important. Case volume, first of all, is, is a good thing because it might allow you to cut down on your fluoro. But just as equally important, uh, case volume increases your fluoro if you're using fluoro a lot. Simply you're in the case, uh, you're, in, you're, you're doing so many more cases. Operator expertise, of course, I know people out there that use you know, a minute of fluoro, a minute and a half of fluoro to do a transeptal or whatever doing their complicated arrhythmias. And I'm not saying that's, um, that's a bad thing, uh, uh, but I would say if you have the operators that have more expertise, they're able to pull this off. Unfortunately, a lot of the young EPs coming out now, uh, they might not be so adept to using fluoro for a minute or two for an ablation, and they might use far longer than that. And finally, the length of the procedure. This is becoming a real issue now. This was not an issue 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we weren't doing AFib. So now we're doing a lot of AFib, and these procedures are getting longer, not necessarily the PBIs, but we're, take, we're tackling uh, unusual atrial tachycardia, as you, you saw in the seminar, where we're looking after uh, persistent, long-standing persistent AFib. And now with heart failure patients, we might even have another indication to go after long-standing persistent AFib. So these cases do take a long time. So there's a nice article that came out. It's a pretty old article now, but I don't believe any of these data have changed. Uh, this author is a radiologist and called the cardiologist a contemporary radiologist, because if you look at the use of nuclear medicine in 2006, 85% of all nuclear medicine in America was cardiovascularly uh, uh, performed, as opposed to radiologists doing most of the chest x-rays. So we, this number's got to be higher now, in my opinion, because most practices have spec scanners and cut scanners 
and we'll go over that. And, uh, and we are uh, true radiologists. I mean, my practice has a 256 slice CT scanner as well. So we're doing all sorts of imaging in cardiovascular medicine, and, and we are radiologists. And these patients are getting the radiation. And remember that when they have to sit on your table or lay on your table for a you know, two-hour persistent AFib case, for example. So exposure, unfortunately, is not going down. It's actually going up because we have to look at some of the cases that are coming online. The average exposure is about 10 to 15 millisieverts per person over their time in, 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 in cardiology practice. It's, it's quite a bit. Uh, but that doesn't include EP studies and coronary angiography that I'll bring up in a second. However, we're doing a lot of other things, not just electrophysiologists, but uh, we're seeing a lot of the interventionalists do TAVRs that require CINE, uh, complex ablations that requires a lot of fluoro, depending on what we're doing. Um, uh, BT cases, rectal aorta cases, we might be using fluoro for those cases. Uh, chronic totally occluded artery uh, percutaneous intervention, this is done at my hospital. And this probably takes up more uh, fluoroscopy and CINE than most everything that we're doing right now. And endovascular uh, 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 aortic aneurysm repairs. So interventional cardiology risk, if you look at the interventional cardiologist, if you look at a paper that recently came out, it's about three to four times compared as far as radiation exposure then to the diagnostic radiologist. So we're truly, in some ways, radiologists. And the risk, as you know, for medicine is cumulative and it's not uh, per case. So putting everything in perspective, uh, I put this slide together just to, to put everything, to, to allow you to see where we lie when it comes to how much fluoro we're actually using or how much our patients are being uh, irradiated. A chest x-ray we told you is right down here, um, 0 0.02 uh, millisieverts per x-ray. A head CT is about two millisieverts, cardiac PET's about three. When you get to coronary angiography, depending on what you do, this is probably uh, um, a diagnostic or even a relatively easy intervention that's gonna be six millisieverts. Spec scans that everyone probably in, uh, in participating in this conference is probably doing nine. And then we go to EPS RFA, which comes to at least 15 millisieverts. So we're really above the curve, unfortunately, how much for us to be used, and I think these data really come from the advent of ablating complex atrial arrhythmias and also ventricular tachycardias that tend to take a lot longer. Just to put it in perspective for these unfortunate incidents, the Fukushima tsunami incident, those, patient, those workers were exposed to 400 millisieverts and radiation sickness in, it will occur at 1,000 millisieverts. And um, we don't have Hiroshima data, but we definitely have Chernobyl data and those patients had a full six entire sieverts, uh, the workers that were there. And unfortunately, most of those passed away. So uh, this is kind of a perspective of where we stand uh, as far as radiation exposure in our field. Okay, so now those are the facts. Now, now it's opinion, opinion time. And uh, I believe it was uh, the New York senator, I forget his name. Uh, he actually said there's a quote that goes, uh, you know, everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but not to their own facts. So that's what we're gonna, we're gonna just talk about my opinion now. So this is my opinion of how a zero fluoroscopy workflow should go. Starting with, we do everything at Desert Springs Hospital. Uh, we built up a wonderful arrhythmia program there, uh, really doing the highest volume in this part of the Southwest, uh, no doubt in my mind. And also the, I've got a good relationship with the hospital, so they've allowed me to do this kind of work, uh, even with the newer technology. And I think that's really important. So definitely, if you're in a lab, get together with your hospital to say, look, I'm gonna go zero fluoro, but I really wanna use some of this new technology and, uh, and just keep that in mind and work with them for sure. So to start with, uh, there's no lead at all um, worn in the lab. Um, we don't walk in with lead, we don't walk out with lead. I've not worn lead so long that I've actually scrubbed in on a device without lead by accident. So uh, unfortunately, we do have to wear lead for the devices. But we don't, wear, we don't wear any lead in the lab. It's as good. So I feel if you're out up there in a low fluoro situation and you want to move to zero fluoro, do me a favor and take off the lead. Because if you're already low fluoro, the lead is a crutch. And when you walk into the lab with the lead, you're going to want to use that pedal. You know, the best situations start with very easy ablations. We'll talk about that, that you can potentially do all the catheter manipulation without fluoroscopy. Don't wear the lead. You'll, you'll really feel good about that. 
I think the uh, well-versed staff, lab staff is indispensable. This is really important. I don't know if my lab staff, I got the three people, D, uh, Rigo, and Lloyd, who are fantastic at Desert Springs. And uh, you have to work together to do a zero for asking workflow because they have to know what they're looking at as well. It's not as easy because most of these cath lab nurses or cath lab technicians are used to seeing everything on fluoroscopy, so they know when to hand things off and this and that. But now they've got to, they've got to learn to some extent how to read each cardiac echo and look at mapping systems and figure out where catheters are, look for wires. And uh, I'll tell you, I think you know my my staff probably could look at inch cardiac echo better than some of the fellows uh, that you might have seen. So uh, they're very well versed on this. What I do is I place all catheters, if we're doing a study, no matter what it is, through the right and left femoral axis, whether it's femoral artery or femoral vein, we'll go over that in a second. And we use a conventional uh, electroanatomic mapping system. I use Ensign, I think theoretically you could use anyone that has a system where you could follow the catheters from the leg. It's a little bit more difficult with the Biosense system, but definitely doable. I prefer Ensign simply because I could get a uh, easy anatomy very quickly putting my catheters all the way up. We do this again without fluoroscopy and we look at signals and uh, we create a, a right atrial uh, map, so to speak, by putting some catheters and four catheters for an SVT, a couple of catheters for a flutter, what have you. And I'll show you examples of that when we use Atkinsis as well. Intracardic echo is essential and this should be really number one above, no lead is more in the lab personally. Um, if you're not familiar with all the views that you could obtain with ICE, I think it's time that uh, every EP learn this. Uh, this is not, it, you can't learn this just by putting the thing up and doing transeptals. You have to be able to move it to see every structure in the heart. We've become very adept at this. We do our retrograde aortic cusp BTs with no flora. So we're actually mapping the entire aortic root and the ascending descending aorta using intracardiac echo which you can do if you know how to image those structures. And you could, you could definitely see the outflow track of the uh, infant debilum easy with intracardiac echo. So this is tremendously important. And I'm gonna show you some beautiful pictures that uh, uh, we put together for you regarding this. Uh, we'll create a geometry of whatever structure you want to uh, map. Uh, today, we're gonna to be going over a persistent AFib case. So it'll be the left atrium uh, and we do that we tend to get prior imaging if it might help. There are some complicated cases, for example, congenital heart patients or patients with amplats or devices, ASD repairs, et cetera, that I always have a CT scan available for me. So I'm not uh, shocked or confused or perplexed when, when I put catheters up and they don't go where I expect them to go. And then we perform the study and then we do the ablation, again, without any fluoroscopy. Uh, depending on what the ablation is. So today I'm giving you an example of an atrial fibrillation case that we've done, but you can always email me or any questions you might have on how to do anything uh, 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 pluralistically. And then what we've done actually at our lab is um, um, kind of, uh, we've actually modified our workflow so we're able to adapt it to the latest technology. So we don't want to be a one-trick pony and to say, say, okay, we could do ABNRT, we could do um, you know, atrial flutter, you know, we um, might be able to do the right atrial tachycardia. What I'm more interested in is um, uh, the, the workflow adapted for whatever new technology might be coming out and how we could use the system to, 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 to put those products in use as well. We don't want to go back to an older time. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the AccuMap today and this catheter, this wonderful catheter I've used uh, many, many times there that you've talked about pretty much for uh, the day, last couple of days. So we're gonna talk about utilization of this uh, device in a non fluoroscopic environment. So why do I use this? I will come back to this later. I, I, this is firmly embedded in my workflow for eight, all atrial arrhythmias. My case volume is, mostly atrial fibrillation at this time. In fact, I have a higher percentage of persistent and CHF patients with AFib than paroxysmal at this time. So I found this, uh, this method and this uh, the mapping technology to be really useful. And I'll show you how that is on this case we're doing. Um, I don't need to go over these points, but if you have questions, we could do it at the end. It does allow ultra rapid, and I didn't put rapid because every conventional mapping system has a rapid mapping 
form. So I'm going to call it ultra rapid mapping of atrial arrhythmias. This is uber rapid. It's faster than anything you could do with your multipolar catheters with uh, Rhythmia or Biosense or, or, or Enzyme or what have you, whatever you use. And uh, one thing I want to say, you can, as you've seen, uh, you can map atrial fibrillation because the sampling rate is so fast that you're able to uh, map within the cycle length of atrial fibrillation. It does define the anatomy, and I will show you also how to do that fluoroscopically less or non-fluoroscopically uh, to look at that. And, um, and uh, it, it maps unmappable rhythms. What do we mean by unmappable rhythms? How many times have we been in a case where we get an oscillating atrial tachycardia or a flutter or a uh, multifocal tachycardia? And uh, it becomes a real headache to use conventional mapping systems that we have trying to set the windows to be able to map this by contact. Uh, this system maps everything, so it doesn't even matter. You could, you could adjust the window before or after, it doesn't matter. You're capturing the entire entire atrium in one, one beat, so to speak. So uh, and we had a beautiful case, and I'll show you that, where we had a, a rhythm like that we could map conventionally. We could do multiple remaps as rhythms change. I will show you that I could create a uh, anatomy in my lab in probably about 45 seconds. And we can map the left atrium in about 48 seconds, 49 seconds, somewhere around there, the entire atrium by moving it around. Uh, so that allows us to do multiple remaps as rhythms change. That's always good. It's a headache to go in after you made your line of block to put another contact catheter and spend another 10 or 15 minutes doing it, where you could just put this up in the left atrium and do a, a very, very quick map to see how good your lines are or what else we're missing. It allows us a good confidence in where I want to put my lesions. Uh, it tends not to lie. It's quite accurate. Uh, it's been validated quite well, so uh, we're using it quite a bit, and I'll show you how we use it in a few minutes. And it does reduce case time, in my opinion. If you have a good workflow with this, and you have a great team like I have in Las Vegas that uh, come in from California to do these cases with me, um, they, 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 provide, they provide the maps very quickly, they analyze them, and uh, we could get these case times for persistent AFibs uh, down to a more reasonable uh, number. And we could talk about that at the end if you wish on how we do that. So it's, I should, it's pretty obvious. It's firmly embedded in my AF treatment workflow for sure. It is FDA approved, as you know, for atrial arrhythmias. I, you know, if it's a complicated right side atrial arrhythmia, of course I'll use it. You know, standard typical cable track customer dismiss uh, type of flutter, probably not. And, you know, basic uh, pacing maneuvers uh, probably is all you need in that situation. Okay, so let's go over some pictures. I'm going to run some uh, videos, and um, this is me. I think the Accutus guys, they really wanted to show me sitting here. I, I don't like that. I don't like to be on camera, but um, so what we're looking at here is initially what we're seeing is when we, uh, oh, wait, sorry. Okay, so we first put up the uh, ice probe. The picture on the right right here is the right ventricle, right atrium. We see a beautiful tricuspid valve here. If I counter, if I clock this probe just a little bit without putting any flex on it, I'm able to see in that position the intraatrial septum that beautifully comes in. And you see here, even in this view, I could see a left lower and slightly a right lower pulmonary vein. Well, a left, a left lower and a left upper pulmonary vein. We'll see better pictures of that in a second. So this is very, very important. Just um, getting that ice probe up, just a couple of workflow questions you might have. We started putting this up, and you might ask, how do you put this thing up blindly? It's a nine French sheet. Well, I put it on the left side, and we used to put just a short 10 French sheath in, but the problem is all the branches of the veins all the way up to the right atrium. So we're starting to put a long wire up and putting a 26 centimeter, uh, my lab staff can tell me how to know, it's long but it uh, kind of uh, uh, goes past a lot of these uh, branches, so we're able to direct this right into uh, uh, the heart. Now, sometimes it does get stuck in the liver, and so, uh, again, this is one thing you need to learn, what it looks like when you're actually going to the liver rather than going up into the heart, and uh, you know how to maneuver it uh, to get it out of there when you need to. Okay. So our transeptal, and I'm sure this is very familiar to a lot of patient, uh, people out there doing um, minimally floral, uh, uh, minimal floral cases. I, I don't use flora at all to put the wire up. 
what I do is in this view right here, I'm seeing left atrium, and I'm going to posteriorly direct that ice probe just as such to see the SVC. So this is the SVC, and as I do this, I'll actually place the wire into the SVC. So this could be done without fluoroscopy. You don't need to see that wire going up. You'll feel where it's going. This is not a stiff wire. It's just a loopy 5 j uh, You're pretty safe to do this. And then we'll bring the sheath up, up here, and we'll inject a few bubbles just to make sure that the bubbles are originating from up high, which is close to the, uh, to the, to the head. At that point, we will uh, bring our needle down in this view. And I like to go a little posterior simply because we see the veins here rather than totally where the mitral valve is, depending on atrial size. And we see this, and I tend to use just a standard SL1 sheath. There's many out there. I don't use an SR, I don't use a zero, I use a one. Uh, I tend to like that, I use a broken bro needle. The sheath is across here, as you can see, no problem. It's, it's clearly uh, posterior more than anything else. I'm putting a wire across there as well, so we can see that, uh, that wire as well. And that wire is going up into the uh, left upper pulmonary vein in this view, okay? And that's another sheet that we're putting up. So we have our double transeptal here. So we, we, so that wire that you saw before, I apologize, was to change it to a steerable sheet. And this is a fixed sheet that's coming up. So this is basically our go-to setup initially for atrial fibrillation ablation, whether it's PBI, persistent, or atrial tachycardia. So in this situation, what I want to show was uh, how uh, feasible it is. And I think this is the, 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 the money shots coming up in this, in this uh, presentation, how we're going to see the AccuMap Acu catheter in the left atrium. So let's run that. Now, I was told by someone reliable that this is a 16 French outer sheath that we need for the acutus. And if I'm mistaken there, someone can interrupt and tell me the outer is not 16. Either way, it's a lot bigger than eight and a half that we put in. As you can see, the wire is a stiffer wire. I 100% make sure that I see that wire in the left upper and I shove the sheath right across that. So we see, and there's only one sheath there because this is after we've done most of our PVIs. I don't think I needed two sheets at that time. So we just placed that, that one sheath up. The next wire coming up is the wire that's gonna bring the Acu catheter, Acu map catheter up. Again, wire for sure, confirm that you're in the left upper pulmonary vein. You can perforate the left atrial appendages with this wire. And now we see that beautiful um, catheter in all its glory in this view. Uh, it is posteriorly directed there. So now the question is, how do we use it? How, we do, how do we manipulate it? And uh, go from there. Um, as far as the real-time pictures in the lab, the sync might be a little bit off just to let you know, but and I'm not really that short, I'm actually sitting down. Okay, so, um, all right, so we're running that again. So let's move on. Okay, so here we see the AccuMap creating a geometry. The picture on the right is from the AccuMap the mappers, and they're doing this very, this is a two times uh, uh, speed, okay, just to show you how we're doing this. This is a PA view here, okay. Here, you can actually see in the not, uh, with only ice, I am rotating this device around in the different areas of the heart. I'm using my technician, a D is next to me. Sometimes she holds the ice and she'll actually rotate it in such a view. Here's a beautiful view of the right upper pulmonary vein, the right lower pulmonary vein in this view, and the Acu uh, map catheter is in that view. Here's an anterior view with the valve here. This would be, I'm going toward the appendage, which should be right here. Uh, we don't want to shift that in the appendage, and we certainly don't want to put it into the ventricle. Not approved, but that's what we did there. And we're, allowed, we're able to get that map very quickly. And this is basically getting uh, a geometry of that left atrium. Uh, I'm sure you've talked about that soon enough, hopefully we'll have a, a, a vein tool to get the veins as well. But right now, we're seeing the body of the atrium. This is the left upper, left lower pulmonary vein, right's on this side. This is a PA view here, just to orient yourself. And that's what we're going to use when we look at the dipole density and uh, use the inverse algorithm to, to show the propagation of waves on that chamber. Okay. 
So, Dr. Gourash, it, yes. it appears that we do have a question from the audience and I do just want to remind all our participants as well, please feel free to use the chat room uh, to ask your questions of Dr. Gouraj. Uh, this is a great opportunity to engage. Um, I just wanted to touch on one of those questions to highlight on something you were just saying about your staff. We had a question from Dr. Kim. What steps did you take to provide a forum for your staff to learn to interpret the ICE images? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think that's a fantastic question. We didn't have any uh, formal class by any means, but I've been using ICE for many, many years. But what I've done, I think we've done so many cases together that I'm actually pointing things out to my fellow and Dee usually is my tech on these cases and she'll be looking at that and she's gotten very good at, at identifying wires, identifying structures. Uh, and, and I think it takes time. Can there be a, a in service with an ICE representative that's an echocardiographic uh, technician? I think that's a great way to do it. I've, I've promoted that 10, 15 years ago with, with Biosense and I think they provided that kind of, uh, kind of help. But I don't think you need to do that. If you're confident with your eyes, I don't think you need anyone to teach your staff except yourself if you know how to get these views. Now, if you don't know how to get the views, that's a whole different ballgame. I think in that situation, you might actually want to have one of the reps come in to say, look, put a little posterior tilt, put an anterior tilt, counter clock it, clock it. And you'll be able to see things you never knew. And I did that 15 years ago. So, um, but that's a great question. That's what I would do. And, uh, the more cases well, thank you for answering that. Feel free, continue on, and I encourage everyone to continue using the chat function, and we'll take the rest of the questions at the end of the session. Okay, so moving on, um, you've seen some, hopefully, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I bet you've seen some good SuperMet uh, data now acquiring uh, from the previous symposia um, with uh, atrial arrhythmias. I just want to show you how in real time that this can be and this is not, by the way, my ultrasounds are not spread up. This is, this is real time. So I think it was 48 to 50 seconds we were able to uh, completely get a super map of a sinus rhythm at the time. So again, they're not synced completely, but you see, as I move this catheter here, in different views, again, the right upper, right lower pulmonary vein, this basket is moving on their screen to the anatomy I provided using the, the geometry function. And I'm able to move this anteriorly, posteriorly toward the septum. You could even bring it around, loop it around into the lower here and get the floor of the septum, which is more difficult. But you could get every structure if you see it. Here's appendage, beautiful uh, view of the appendage in this view. And we can see the sheath is just at the septum here. So you want to be very careful not to lose the sheath behind the septum because it is 12 inner diameter. It's going to be difficult to push that thing across again. So uh, just make sure you keep that sheath across with your AccuMap catheter while you're doing it. So here, I think it's playing it over again so you can see it being used here, what's happening. And, we've, and basically you're painting the structure, I call it, or I, maybe they call it, and it tells us where these rhythms are coming from and you could uh, display that on your map. But again, about a 48 second acquisition time for a super map. Um, this was a slide that was nicely, uh, um, provided by Acutus on SuperMap. And essentially, just to reiterate, uh, if you haven't heard, SuperMap is their uh, version of, of a standard map of a non-oscillating tachycardia using references. So they'll use the coronary sinus reference. Uh, they will, uh, we looked at how fast the workflow is. They're looking at dipole density very rapidly, non-contact around the atrium. They're able to beat match as necessary, and then they will put that non-contact solution, uh, that inverse solution they use to change the dipole densities calculated into something that looks more like a, um, a propagation map. So that is SuperMap, and SuperMap is fantastic for these very regular rhythms, but the beauty of Acutus is not SuperMap. That's one, one beauty of it. The real beauty is when you have an oscillating tachycardia, I'll talk to you about, that it is impossible to map if not tremendously difficult with conventional mapping systems. Okay, so that is really everything to talk about um, uh, workflow. So we're gonna move on to the case. And I think I have about 25 minutes left, so this shouldn't take too long. I'll show you some nice maps and hopefully we can open up some questions. So this is a case uh, we actually uh, taped uh, just last week, uh, right before HRS week, it's fantastic. 
57 year old male with obesity, uh, sleep apnea, diabetes, hypertension, you know, CHAD score of uh, 20. Uh, high, symptomatic, uh, high symptomatic AF with RVR despite multiple indications. He's been cardioverted by me in the past. Uh, he does feel better in sinus rhythm, which is a question that I always ask, but he recurs within a week. Uh, does not want any more medicines, a young guy. Normal LV function, he does have a dilated left atrium. And you saw the atrium, that case that I just showed you the pictures of was this case. So not a massive atrium by any means, but probably a good five centimeter atrium. And he was on anticoagulation. Um, again, uh, for the workflow, I, I, stand, I stick with standards. At guidelines, I don't stop anticoagulation. Uh, it's uh, non-discontinued anticoagulation for these non-fluoro cases as well. Okay, just some basic electrograms. This is, uh, you know, atrial, and this is his baseline, pretty fractionated, pretty fine type of atrial fibrillation. Uh, I just have a 10 pole catheter up. I didn't put a 20 pole in the situation for teaching purposes. So we can see what happens to this catheter as I ablate. Uh, and we see the atrial fibrillation here in the sweep speed of 200 millimeters per second. Um, very quickly, one quick slide on the ablation of a persistent AFib, and it can be summarized by this. The lesion set is unclear, so this is kind of where we are, and everyone does something a little bit different, but uh, we're learning more with new technology. So these new technological advances like Accutus are crucial for our understanding of the pathophysiology of something we really don't understand. So the mapping that we use with Accutus during AF basically, as been shown in the symposium, shows identification of convection perturbations that cannot be seen by conventional mapping. So we're going to see rotational activity or slow conduction or focal activity or regions of interest, so to speak. And ablation of these regions of interest in the situation of persistent AFib might, might, may improve success. And uh, I will go and another show you, and this is not an accident. This is a case like another case, multiple cases I've done where we see uh, changes in cycle, changes in the rhythmia as we ablate persistent atrial fibrillation. And again, um, I believe this product, the AccuMap catheter and Accutus mapping, uh, is really shines in persistent atrial fibrillation. It's going to change uh, really the way we think about the pathophysiology and, uh, in the years to come. So we're still very early on, but quite intriguing. Uh, quick map, I'm not going to go over how I do this. If you have some questions at the end, how we do this non fluoroscopically uh, completely, I use radar frequency. Uh, just a baseline background. I'll use uh, between 35 and 40 watts, and you know, I'll be watching myself to temperatures. The beauty of ice is I could actually mark the esophagus, so it's very easy to see on ice, so I know exactly where to go and where to avoid. However, it might not. I know there's people arguing that it might not be the best way to avoid esophageal injury, but it does give me a little peace of mind. Uh, we started with initial PBI that's shown here on the left side. And uh, we followed with a box lesion set. We did prove block here, uh, even prior to the Accutus maps, by placing a high density grid catheter here, showing uh, atrial ectopy isolated from the rest of the atrium, uh, which is fascinating. So, this was definitely a blockbuster wall. So, this is one of the Accutus maps after the PVI. So, we didn't do the posterior wall yet. This is a PA view here. And this is basically like a AP RAO view on this side. So these are the right veins here. These are the left veins over here. And this is the mitral valve here to orient you. And if you stare at this thing, it should cycle through. You'll see areas where it's been marked that there's some slow conduction in this area that we could call this a region of interest. It's quite intriguing. And this is during atrial fibrillation. So we have to keep in mind that there might be some focal activity as well. We see this kind of rotational activity in the lower area, probably around where I made my line. There might be slow conduction there. But clearly, there's rapid conduction across the, uh, the posterior wall. So this is kind of a starting point to think, you know, I think we probably need to go in this area over here. We're probably going to have to ablate in this area over here. Um, I'm changing my workflow. And again, I would love to hear other opinions on whether it's worth really spending time with cafes. Uh, versus really having Accutus kind of lead you in certain directions. I've had better luck actually looking at the Accu maps and going after areas that I find intriguing rather than spending uh, 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 quite a bit of time possibly putting the patient at risk for uh, doing uh, fractionated atrial electrogram um, high population, especially in the posterior wall. 
So nevertheless, this is that map. We have another map after the poster wall. And this is a little bit confusing, but trust me, there is block here. But sometimes you see this like topic focus come in and uh, you can't get rid of that. Sometimes you'll see it fire. You see something right here, like a little focal activity here, maybe the focal activity up here. So there's some really interesting things happening after we took out the veins in the poster wall. This is quite intriguing down here and that's gonna come back later because we're gonna ablate that area as well. So we did another uh, kind of a guided uh, lesion set. I, I'm not gonna show all my lesion sets, but at the end of the day, I did feel there's very slow conduction here. I did make a very nice line of block from this portion of the mitral annulus. Again, this is an AP view, so this is the right upper pulmonary vein here. From the mitral annulus to the right upper pulmonary vein, it was about five and a half centimeters or so. But it was done nicely, and we did show block across that lesion in multiple modalities. Uh, this was that region of interest that we did uh, blade at 40 watts in this region. Um, and then we did another map after we did that poster wall ablation. And some interesting things are happening. I haven't shown you the electrograms yet, but the electrograms are becoming very organized while we do this. And you see here is almost like a focal area, and I could kind of play that back. Okay, so here, this is after the anterior wall. You see there's something here, maybe a focal activity going in this direction, going in this direction. There might be, a, there, it looks like this line of block here. You don't see that wave front going any further there. So some interesting things happening. That could be a QRS, hard to say. But nevertheless, we did see some focal activity. And when we were doing this map, we saw something very interesting. Uh, the patient organized to what appears to be an atrial tachycardia, but there's something very intriguing here. If you look at one, two, oh, and really five, six, seven, eight, this is the uh, distal coronary sinus, uh, sorry, proximal coronary sinus, and this is the distal coronary sinus here. The proximal has a different firing rate than the rest of the coronary sinus, quite intriguing. This would be an absolute impossibility, in my opinion, to map with our conventional mapping system. It's gonna be very difficult to tell what the heck's going on. There are multiple lesions made. This is very possible that this area might be isolated from the rest of the atrium. Very hard to say until we do further maps, but very intriguing finding to be found that this patient had very coarse and very fine AFib and organized nicely. And then when we looked at the map here of this tachycardia, watch the circle. You're gonna see some nice focal firing during this tachycardia, basically looking at everything. So we're not we're looking at 9, 10, 70. We're not using references here. We're looking at true atrial depolarization. And we could see an area here that we saw on the anterior map before that I went after. We went after this area as well. We ablated here and ablated here. And when we finished up, I'm gonna run that one more time because I find this a beautiful map that I don't think you'll be able to see this with any other type of fidelity, but you could see something going on here and um, we'll see it here as well along the ridge, okay? Somewhere along the ridge. Again, this is the left upper, left lower the appendage would be here. This is the ridge here. This is the anterior side, the appendage would be here. This is just anterior to the appendage. So AP here, left lateral on this side. So we did put uh, ablation, but I didn't put all my ablation signals here because I didn't know how much time I'd have, but I did go after the focal finding on the anterior side, as well as that, that kind of the posterior inferior area down here. And then we finally made a lesion just along the ridge here. And during that ablation lesion, uh, this tachycardia terminated the sinus. And you can see here, we actually, uh, during the ablation, we got rid of whatever was firing at 910 is gone now. So it's quite fascinating. And I suspect that it might have been isolated from a little bit rest of the atrium, hard to say. But nevertheless, this does certainly seem like a, a nice success. Of course, we know there's no correlation here, true correlation between this and long-term success. But it is a nice feeling that we're able to map something that in many ways would be really perplexing for us. So what are my final thoughts? So we could open it up for questions. Number one. Uh, zero flora environment in the EP lab should be the goal. I don't think low flora is the goal. I think zero flora is the goal. I think it can be done. Uh, I think there's a lot of hesitancy among a lot of physicians out there. I was one of them that were set in my ways and didn't want to spend a lot of time saying, hey, I'm okay with one minute, two minutes of flora. But I just got to the point I didn't want to wear the lead anymore. And uh, I just made myself do this and then 
I've taught everyone else how to do this as well. So it, it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite fulfilling. You can adapt this workflow to act this technology. I think it's absolutely safe, effective. It was very fulfilling, actually, because you're sitting there working this catheter that's got a very nice feel to it. It's, it's soft enough that I, I don't have to worry too much about the perforation risks of some of these older arrays that some of the older EPs and myself have been used in the past. Uh, so I think it's, it's quite good for that. I think use of intrachronic echo is generally limited nowadays. It's poorly accepted by physicians for unorthodox uses. And I say this because I've actually told physicians about this and that's what they think. If you see most low fluoro labs, um, they will use their ultrasound for many aspects. But most of the time in many labs, it's only used for the transeptal. And at that time they're watching for pericardial infusion, but rather than look for other structures and try to point out different structures and catheters within your, within the atrium. Uh, but this could certainly be learned. This is an easily learned skill. So what does this technology do for me? It definitely shifts the age-old paradigm of arrhythmia mapping. So the age-old paradigm of arrhythmia mapping is, well, you got to compare it to something. That's always been the age-old paradigm. This is not the paradigm anymore. It's not about comparisons. It's about seeing everything in a holistic view without having to compare something that you already have in the heart. Uh, if you think about it, it seems absolutely obvious that that's what we're doing here. It's showing us some new possibilities of what we could ablate. I think we're going to see some great studies coming out in the future of uh, ablation of these regions of interest and looking at long-term success. And finally, indispensable in my patients with complex atrial arrhythmias. If I have a complex atrial arrhythmia redo, I do a lot of uh, uh, redos from other areas, other hospitals, uh, complex atrial arrhythmias. We all know after you do a persistent atrium and they come back with atrial tachycardia, you could be in there for a long time. So uh, this could be really useful in this uh, situation. So I want to just do some acknowledgments. I want uh, Akitas uh, Medical for kind of uh, uh, allowing me to do this and uh, participating in this fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, seminar. Shivaji and Enzo, thank you for uh, putting those uh, slides together. Not the slides, but the movies. I didn't know how to do that. It's fantastic. It was great. Desert Springs Hospitals, where I work, I think uh, without their support, we can't do this kind of cutting edge stuff. And of course, my Desert Lab EP staff, I don't know if you're listening in, but Dilo and Rigo uh, did the best. So thank you so much and um, stay safe and uh, hopefully we'll get through these unprecedented times. All right, Dr. Guraj, we have some questions uh, in the chat room that um, I can give to you. And if you'd like to answer those, that would be fabulous. Uh, I start I'm sorry, yeah, start can you stop sharing my screen? Yeah, no problem. Here we go. Okay, what would you say is the biggest learning curve with the transition from dependence on fluoro to an echo facilitated workflow? Yeah, I think the, uh, the biggest hurdle, uh, I think that the biggest hurdle is gonna be, okay, let me put it in perspective. I'm a pilot, so I'll put it in perspective of flying a plane. Uh, when you're flying a plane in the clouds, right? You're not looking outside the windows. You're actually trusting all your instruments and all the instruments that you have on your panel. Um, and that's how going floralist is. I mean, you have to trust your imaging skills. If you don't know how to use intracardiac echo or transesophageal echo, um, it's going to be really difficult to transition. Uh, it's not easy to do otherwise. Uh, I think you have to see structures. So the hardest point is going to be learning the views. And the moment you learn the views, putting things up into the heart is going to be the easy part because you've been doing that, the EPs have been doing that for 20 years. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be the most difficult part. So I think that would be the first thing. If you're not using ICE on a regular basis, see if your hospital will allow you to use ICE on a, let's say, a right atrial flutter and see if you could visualize the cava trachospinismus. See if you could visualize your catheter on there and, and do it that way. If you can, you're halfway there. Putting the catheter in the, in the right atrium, uh, you know, my daughter can do that. It's a matter of uh, you know using your eyes to put it in the right place. That's what makes us experts. Yeah, so easing yourself into it essentially. Um, so leads to our next question here. How much time have you saved in your persistent AF ablations by utilizing a no fluoro technique, as well as utilizing the acutus mapping system when compared to traditional fluoroscopy and contact mapping cases? That's a really awesome question. I think it's very beautifully phrase actually, good question. So number one, I would tell you, if you're gonna go floralist, it's gonna take, there's a learning curve for sure. So it's gonna take some time to be very comfortable with looking at that ice, very comfortable by saying, I'm not wearing lead today. That's gonna to take some time. We've got to the point that we've got it down to an art. 
to some extent. We do have some, you know, intriguing cases we're perplexed sometimes, but most of the times we're not. So that case that we just showed you uh, took me about one hour to do everything, maybe one hour, one hour, 10 minutes with all the lesion sets, everything. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. So that's access to the point that I'm pulling the first string in the right groin after I pull back into sheet out. So uh, you can do this quickly. You, you can do this safely. And with the Accutus for sure, the fact that we did four maps, that would have taken, let's say 10 extra minutes, maybe 15 extra minutes. In my hands, it might take less or more for other people. But at the end of the day, yeah, you're gonna save yourself maybe 40, 45 minutes on mapping even, and, and that's if you can map the rhythm. If you have atrial fibrillation, well, forget about it. You can't put up a good catheter or a, tech, or a, or a, a lasso and figure out what's going on or a tech, right? Uh, but if you have a atrial tachycardia, you could go up. It's gonna take a little bit more time. So uh, the floralist, yes, it took a while to get to the point that I'm quite quick with it. The acutus has made it a lot easier. I feel very comfortable with that device now. And, uh, Great, we, thank you for answering that. Um, it appears to be a repeated theme. We keep hearing from a lot of our users over the last few days. As you know, we've had this global EP summit going on um, and having a lot of discussions from several of our users and speed tends to be one of those things that keeps being brought up. How fast we map, how many maps we're able to generate. Um, so, you know, it only confirms that with the statements you just made as well. Um, it looks like someone's well, asking- One thing, Jennifer, I have to interrupt. My surgical mentor, before I went into doing all this stuff, used to tell me there's no such thing as good slow surgeons, but there are bad fast ones. So we could always say fast speed, 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 but it's gotta be safe, it's gotta be safe. So Definitely, 100%, and that's one of our primary things. Safety is one of our major concerns here. Of course, we want procedural safety for our patients as the first thing. Um, it looks like someone's asking you to quantify in a sense. Uh, what are the number of procedures that you performed before you felt comfortable using the Acumap catheter floralessly? Uh, well, I did the first case actually floralessly. I've never used this catheter with x-ray. So uh, I felt very comfortable with my skills to do that. So, and like I said, I'm not joking. I've never seen that catheter other than in a, in a, in a pamphlet, what it looks like on the fluoroscopy screen. So um, at, the, at the end of the day, uh, we started initially with that. Uh, of course, uh, we had, you know, we had one of the first Gen 2 systems, I believe. So we also had uh, the reps were also learning some of the new uh, uh, systems. So it took a little bit longer, just a learning curve there. But overall, I felt comfortable from the very beginning, as long as you're comfortable with uh, doing transeptal sheath exchanges and wire exchanges. Sure. Okay, great. Um, just going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, somebody's asking, about, do the regions of interest tend to be similar in many cases? A number of the presentations I've seen show interesting activity, low posterior near the LIPV, and high septal anterior. Yeah, I have to, that's a great, great question and a great observation. I have also seen the same thing. I find it fascinating. Uh, usually that anterior area that we ablated, that seems to be a region of interest in many, many times. And what we did in this situation was actually extend the line all the way up to the right upper pulmonary vein. We've also seen lower areas in the lower, um, the left lower pulmonary vein. And we've also seen a lot of this focal firing nowadays too, even in atrial fibrillation at baseline, you'll see some of these focal regions of interest. But those areas seem to be quite important um, for whatever reason, yes. Okay, very good. And another question in line with that, you know, in regards to your procedural workflow, in a sense, what is your approach to redo atrial fibrillation cases? Okay. Uh, redo cases can be really pretty difficult. Depends on what's happened to the patient since they've had their procedure. Have they converted to a persistent type? Are they still paroxysmal? You know, most of the redos with the paroxysmals, I'll take a look at the veins. And we, we might give uh, uh, Prel kind of uh, the Marcinski technique to, to see if any extra pulmonary vein triggers. For example, if they are persistent at that time, uh, it's for sure we will look at the veins to make sure they're isolated, but the, that Acutus uh, Acumap catheter is going to go up uh, immediately on these reviews to help us out. It'll also uh, give us an idea where some of those lines of block may have been made by prior ablators, even during atrial fibrillation, because you'll be able to see those wave fronts uh, collide and, and slow down. Great. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, it appears that we're getting close to the end of the hour. So um, any closing comments from you, uh, commentary you'd like to share? 
No, I mean, I think uh, I think this whole symposium is really good. I've kind of looked at it. I'm sorry I could not have tuned in. I'm, I'm off this week. But uh, at the end of the day, I really appreciate you guys uh, inviting me to do this. I think it's an important product. I think it's it, – and the beauty is we're we're and we're kind of we're we're kind of with this type of mapping where grain sig was with angioplasty back in seventy eight right we're we're just really at the beginning we can only think about where this technology is going to go because I really do believe it's going to be the future for a lot of this complex stuff we're doing so and then the final point is yeah please if you're if you're not doing zero floor give it a go but start with something easy if you're not comfortable with it do a right atrial flutter take your time use an ice probe and uh, you'll, you'll be fine. Great, thank you for those encouraging comments um, to everyone in the audience, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you Vince for being on with us. Thank you Dr. Guraj, we appreciate you sharing your expertise and the presentation on this hot topic. We know floorless procedures are, uh, you know, a, it's very common, people are talking about it, there's a lot of chatter about it, and we want to encourage it based on all those things that you said are benefits to not only the providers in the lab, the patients, everyone involved. Um, it's been quite an engaging session today. Thank you for joining me today and I'll see you shortly.